Hi and welcome to this 11th topic of the OCR A-Level Chemistry Specification. This one's Enthalpy Changes. Now throughout this video I'm going to use the term enthalpy and you can think of that as a kind of heat content of a chemical. It's got the symbol H and a lot of the time we're talking about enthalpy changes and enthalpy changes is given the symbol delta H. So we came across the Greek letter delta for the partial charges. This is a capital delta and it looks basically like a triangle. And I also used the word enthalpy in a previous video when I talked about average bond enthalpies as the amount of energy it takes to break one mole of a specified bond. When you break a load of bonds and then make a load of different bonds, you get often a change in the amount of enthalpy which is contained within those bonds. And when the enthalpy changes, you get heat which is either given out into the surroundings or absorbed from the surroundings. So you get a temperature change. When you talk about those at GCSE, an exothermic reaction is one which increases the temperature of the surroundings, and an endothermic reaction is one which decreases the temperature of the surroundings. And you also draw enthalpy profile diagrams. You don't call them that, but you draw enthalpy profile diagrams for exothermic and endothermic reactions. And so I'll draw them now. And so you draw these at GCSE. This is normally labelled energy on the y-axis, but now I've labelled it as enthalpy. In both of these cases, the left hand horizontal line represents the reactant and the right horizontal line represents the product. And you need to be able to label an enthalpy profile diagram with the reactants, the products, the enthalpy change and the activation energy for both an exothermic and an endothermic reaction. And these come up as three mark questions. The marks tend to be for putting the products and the reactants and if it's an exothermic reaction having the products lower down than the reactants and if it is an endothermic reaction, having the products higher than the reactant. The second mark is for the activation energy arrow and the label, and the third for the enthalpy change label and arrow. It's important that the activation energy always goes from the reactant's enthalpy to the peak, and the same for an endothermic reaction from the reactant to the peak. And for an enthalpy change, it always goes from the reactant to the product. So the arrow should go down for an exothermic reaction and up for an endothermic reaction. So exothermic reactions have a negative enthalpy change and endothermic reactions have a positive enthalpy change. The activation energy, if I haven't said it before, is the minimum energy required for a reaction to take place. Now as with a lot of the other topics as well with chemistry, there is some terminology that we need to talk about. The first one is standard conditions which you can say are 298 Kelvin and 101 kilopascal, and standard states, which is the state that a chemical would be in under standard conditions. The enthalpy change of a reaction is this. It's the change in enthalpy when one mole of a reaction takes place. Now that depends upon the stoichiometric coefficients that are put into the equation. So if I draw an equation, I'll show you what I mean. So, in this reaction, one mole of nitrogen would react with three moles of hydrogen to make two moles of ammonia. And the enthalpy change that happens when one mole of that reaction happens, so exactly the quantity that I just stated, would be minus 92 kilojoules. And if I wrote this out as 2 N2 plus 6 H2 makes 4 NH3, then the enthalpy change would be twice as much. So it matters what the numbers are in an enthalpy change of reaction. So that would be an enthalpy change of minus 184 kilojoules. But of course, there's more. We've got enthalpy changes of formation, enthalpy changes of combustion, enthalpy changes of neutralization to talk about. And that helps us to compare the values and use them in other equations. And that's what the next part of this topic's about. I'll do it as a separate video because it's Hesse's law and it's gonna take a little while. The enthalpy change of formation is specifically the enthalpy change which accompanies the formation of one mole of a compound from its elements under standard conditions with everything in its standard states. So for instance, the formation of ammonia would be half N2 plus three over two H2 makes one mole of NH3. So the standard enthalpy change of formation of ammonia is minus 46, so half this value, because I've halved all of the stoichiometric coefficients in that equation. The next one is enthalpy change of combustion. Enthalpy change of combustion is the enthalpy change which accompanies the combustion, or the complete combustion, of one mole of a substance under standard conditions with everything in its standard states. And the last one is enthalpy change of neutralization. 
and that's the end of the challenge which accompanies the formation of one mole of water in a neutralization reaction under standard conditions with everything in its standard states. The standard state for any solution has to have a concentration of one mole per decimeter cubed. So for all of those standard entropy changes, the entropy change of formation, the entropy change of combustion, the entropy change of neutralization, they all contain one mole. There was one mole of a compound being formed, or one mole of a substance being burnt, completely in oxygen, or one mole of water being made. So in the questions where they ask you to define standard entropy changes, remember you have to talk about one mole of something. And you also need to say standard conditions and standard states for all of those standard entropy changes, which is why they're called standard. And they have symbols to go along with that. So the entropy change, I've said, was delta H. The standard symbol is a circle with a horizontal line through it. Sometimes you see it as just a circle. And then it's a standard entropy change of formation. And there's a subscript F. If it's a standard entropy change of neutralization, F is an N. And if it's combustion, it's a C. OK, so how do we work out standard entropy changes or any entropy change of reaction? The way it's typically done is by heating a known mass of water and then measuring the temperature change of that water. And then we use the specific heat capacity equation that you might have seen at GCSE to calculate the energy change when that happens. The only other information you need to know apart from the mass and the temperature change is the specific heat capacity of water, and that's given to you on the data sheet. And this is done in a few different ways, but they all have one thing in common. They all heat water or a solution, and they all measure the temperature change of that water or that solution. If you're not given a mass of solution, you will be given a volume of that solution or the volume of the water. And the mass of the water in grams is the same as the volume of water in centimetres cubed. So if you're given 100 centimetres cubed of a solution, or for instance, two 50 millilitre solutions are mixed together and heat's given out, you have 100 millilitres or 100 centimetres cubed of solution. That solution, you have to assume, weighs 100 grams. The specific heat capacity equation then is Q equals MC delta T. The Q stands for heat, M, is for mass, C is specific heat capacity, and it's almost always water. And the delta T is a change in temperature. And most people go wrong in these questions by using the wrong mass. They're not using the mass of the water or the solution, but using the mass of whatever it is that was reacted. You'll need that mass, but you don't need it now. This equation tells you how much heat has gone into the water. So everything you put into this equation has to be to do with the water or the solution. So the mass of the water the specific heat capacity of the water, the temperature change of the water. Don't put anything in there which isn't to do with water or a solution. Okay, so a typical question would be this. It says 1.20 grams of carbon was burnt and the energy released heated 500 grams of water from 19 to 37.8 degrees Celsius. Calculate the heat energy released. So heat energy is equal to the mass times by specific heat capacity times by the change in temperature. And the mass is not... 1.2 grams. The mass is 500 grams because it's the mass of whatever it is heated. In this case, water. This question could easily have said 500 millilitres of water or 500 centimetres cubed of water. They'd all give you the same, which is 500 grams of water because the density of water is 1 gram per centimetre cubed. Make sure you look at the units for your specific heat capacity. I'm going to use joules per gram per Kelvin. But if it says kilograms, you need to change this into kilograms. The specific heat capacity of water is 4.2 joules per gram per Kelvin, so 4.2. And the change in temperature is from 19 to 37.8, so that is 18.8 degrees. It's important with these type of questions that you get your units right. You should be looking for a number normally in the thousands or the tens of thousands of joules. If the number is vastly different from that, then just check again, it might be wrong. It might be right, but if you get an answer like, 39, you're probably in kilojoules, so just check the units in the calculation. The next question would normally say, calculate the entropy change of combustion for carbon. And entropy changes are in kilojoules per mole. So the way to get the entropy change is to divide your energy change by the number of moles. And this is where you need 1.2 grams of carbon, because you're not given the number of moles of carbon, you're given a mass of carbon. So you need to change that into an amount so that you can then divide the answer from the previous one by the amount of carbon you used, and that will give you the entropy change of combustion for carbon. 1.2 grams divided by the molar mass of carbon, which is 12, gives you 0.1 moles of carbon were burnt. So per mole, it will be this number divided by this number, and then change it into kilojoules per mole, so divided by 1,000. 
this is an exothermic reaction. I know it's an exothermic reaction because it's heated the water up. And so I made a mistake with this equation that I wrote down. And it's easy to know because if you've heated up a solution or water, then it must be an exothermic reaction. And a lot of the time you get a mark for the sign that you put in the entropy change. Entropy changes to combustion are going to be negative because they're exothermic reaction. And so you can work out the magnitude quite easily, but then think about whether this is heating up or cooling down. If it's heating up, then the entropy change is going to be negative because it's exothermic reaction. If it's cooling down, endothermic reaction, and the delta H is going to be greater than zero, so it's going to be positive. Now sometimes this will be followed up by a question like, why is this value different to the standard entropy change of combustion value that you find in the tables of standard entropy change of combustion data? And there's a few reasons. First of all, this isn't a standard entropy change of combustion. And the reason for that is we didn't start at room temperature. We didn't start at 25 degrees C or 298 Kelvin. We started at 19 Kelvin. Also, it's very possible that when we burnt the carbon, not all of the heat went into the water. And so this temperature change could be lower than you'd expect it to be. To work out proper standard entropy changes of combustion, you need very fancy equipment. If they tell you about any kind of reaction that a student's done, a spirit burner heating water in a can, then a lot of that heat energy has escaped into the atmosphere, not into the water, it's heated up the can. There's lots of things where it goes wrong, so it's not going to be a standard entropy change of combustion. This number is almost always less negative than the actual standard entropy change of combustion because the heat is lost into other places. The next thing in the specification is about average bond entropies, and it says you don't need to know the definitions. But it's useful to know that it's the entropy change when one mole of a specified bond is broken. When you break a covalent bond, you're pulling the atoms apart, and so that's an endothermic process. You have to put energy in to pull atoms apart. Therefore, when you make that same bond, you get an exothermic, you get the release of heat when you make bonds. And in chemical reactions, you have to break bonds and you have to make bonds. And the difference in the amount of energy tells you whether it is exothermic reaction or an endothermic reaction. If the energy used to break the bond is less than the energy that you get when you make the bonds, it's exothermic. If the energy used to break the bond is more than the energy you get out when you make the bond, that's an endothermic process. And you need to be able to calculate a theoretical entropy change based upon the average bond entropies of the reactants in the product. You don't need to remember the data, but you do need to be able to use the data to calculate a theoretical entropy change. They're never going to be the same as the experimental entropy changes because average bond entropies are exactly that. They're averaged across all different types of chemical. So an NH bond could be the NH bond in ammonia or an amine or an amide. So I'll do a really simple one, just the combustion of water to show you how the process works. The process doesn't change depending on the chemicals. It's always exactly the same. You work out the entropy of these bonds, you work out the entropy of these bonds, and then you find the difference and you'll be given the data you need. For this, you need a hydrogen-hydrogen bond entropy, a oxygen-oxygen double bond entropy, and a hydrogen-oxygen bond entropy. Okay, and these bond entropies are in kilojoules per mole. You'll also need to be able to draw these chemicals, so you have to draw a hydrogen molecule, oxygen molecule, water molecule, or they need to be drawn for you so you can see what they look like. You're not a GCS anymore, so they'll probably just give you these values and ask you to draw them, or expect you to draw them. So once you know what the chemicals look like, you know what each of the bonds entropy is, you just add together the ones on the left hand side, you add together the ones on the right hand side, and then just do left minus right and you get your answer. The only place where people sometimes go wrong is forgetting that each water has two oxygen hydrogen bonds, two waters, so that's four oxygen hydrogen bonds. The reason these are positive is because I'm breaking those bonds and so I need to put energy in to break the bonds. So the reason I'm subtracting these, or these are minus, is because those are exothermic because those are bonds that are being made, and making bonds is exothermic. So this energy here should be twice the entropy change of combustion of hydrogen, and twice the entropy change of formation of water. So entropy change of combustion of hydrogen and entropy change of formation of water should have the same value, and it should be half of this. So I'm just going to go and find out what that entropy change is to see how close this average bond entropy is to the actual bond. It's minus 286 for the entropy change of combustion of hydrogen and for the entropy change of formation of water. And minus 286 times 2 is minus 572. So significantly different from that. And that's why we do experiments, because just using these average bond entropies doesn't give you a very accurate answer. 
but it is a whole lot easier than trying to set up the experiment to calculate it very accurately. I just did it in about two minutes. Okay, the last bit of specification is about Hess's law. But I'll do that in a separate video so that it doesn't get too long. If you want to look at the Hess's law video, you'll follow this one. Hope you can join me in the next one. Goodbye.